A comprehensive understanding of the anatomy of the esophagus is critical before undertaking surgical procedures on the esophagus. Figure 16 1 demonstrates key anatomic structures that must be considered before performing a transient esophagectomy. Indications for transthoracic esophagectomy include carcinoma, caustic injury with stricture or dysplastic mucosal changes, and other benign diseases. Most surgeons agree benign disease is best treated with transient esophagectomy which eliminates the risk of intrathoracic anastomotic leak and spares the patient the discomfort of thoracotomy without compromising outcomes. Carcinoma at any level of the esophagus can be safely resected by transiatal approach in performing a transiatal esophagectomy. The surgeon removes accessible cervical, intrathoracic, and intra-abdominal lymph nodes for staging, but a complete on-block resection of adjacent lymph node-bearing tissue is not accomplished. Transiatally esophagectomy results in a lower incidence of pulmonary complications compared with a transthoracic approach. Anastomotic leak rates range from 12% to 15% but have been shown to be approximately 3% with a staple technique when a leak does occur. The associated morbidity and mortality are less than that seen for leaks from an intrathoracic esophagogastrostomy. Informed consent is obtained and the patient is made nothing by mouth status at least 8 hours before the procedure. A bowel preparation can be given to the patient the day before the procedure, in case the colon is needed as a reconstruction conduit. In the operating room, a radial artery catheter should be used for continuous blood pressure monitoring because retrocardiac dissection can cause periods of hypertension central venous access is not routinely necessary, however, if needed, the right neck veins should be used to allow the surgeon complete access to the left side of the neck during operation. A standard endotracheal tube is used for intubation. General endotracheal anesthesia is mandatory for this procedure. Close cooperation and communication between anesthesiologist and surgeon must be maintained, especially during the transiatal dissection when transient hypertension is expected. During this time, inhalation anesthetics that can contribute to hypertension should be discontinued, and the inspired oxygen concentration should be increased. The patient is placed supine on the operating table with the head slightly extended and turned to the right arms are tucked and protected close to the patient's body to allow the surgeon unimpeded access to the neck, chest, and abdomen. The skin over an upper midline supraumbilical incision from the xiphoid process to the umbilicus is used to begin the abdominal portion of the procedure. The exposure should be extended cephalid to excise the xiphoid process to gain maximum access to the esophageal hiatus. A self-retaining retractor can facilitate exposure of the upper abdomen, figures 16 to 1 and 16 to 2. Upon entering the abdomen, the surgeon should perform careful inspection to search for metastatic disease and to ensure the stomach is free from scarring, shortening, or disease that will preclude its use as a suitable conduit for reconstruction. The surgeon must be intimately familiar with the arterial anatomy of the upper abdomen and early in the course of the dissection must identify the left gastropoploic artery and protect this artery throughout the operation. Figure 16 3 To begin mobilization of the stomach. The left triangular ligament is taken down and the left liver lobe is retracted to the right. The greater omentum is separated from the greater curve of the stomach, beginning at an avascular plane approximately at the greater curve's midpoint. Dissection is then carried superiorly to the esophageal hiatus, carefully ligating the left gastropoploic artery and all short gastric vessels. Care must be taken to avoid pinching a portion of the stomach wall within ligature ties of the short gastric vessels which can later lead to necrosis and perforation of the gastric wall once the surgeon has reached the esophageal hiatus. The peritoneum is incised and the distal esophagus encycled with a penrose drain to aid in esophageal retraction and dissection. The lesser omentum is dissected from the lesser curve of the stomach, and the left gastric artery is ligated because its branches supply the lesser curve. All lymph nodes in the area should be included with the specimen identity cation and preservation of the right gastric artery along this dissection plane is attempted. Figure 16 4. Next a pyloromeotomy is performed from 1 to 2 cm on the anterior gastric wall through the pylorus extending approximately 0.5 to 1.0 cm onto the duodenum. We prefer to use a fine-tipped hemostat and needle-tipped bovi for careful dissection of the stomach and duodenum muscular wall away from the underlying mucosa. The surgeon must ensure the mucosa has not been violated if the lumen of the bowel has been entered. 
the mucosal defect is closed primarily and an ecmicolid spiloroplasty is performed. Figure 16.5, the hiatus is enlarged by small radial incisions of the crura to allow much of the esophageal dissection under direct vision through the hiatal keyhole to complete the abdominal portion of the procedure. The Penrose drain is retracted downward and the distal 10 to 15 centimeters of esophagus is mobilized through the hiatus by blunt and sharp dissection. At this point the surgeon must determine that the distal esophagus is free from adhesions or tumor or both to proceed with the operation to complete gastric mobilization. The remaining greater romentum is freed from the greater curve again, preserving the right gastropoploic artery, and a cocker maneuver is performed to ensure maximum gastric mobility. The cervical dissection begins by placing an incision along the anterior border of the left sternocleidomastoid muscle from the hyoid bone to 1 cm above the clavicle. The incision is carried through the platysma to expose the deep cervical fascia. Figure 16.6. The sternocleidomastoid muscle and carotid sheath are attracted laterally while the thyroid gland and trachea are attracted medially to expose the proximal esophagus. Occasionally the middle thyroid vein and inferior thyroid artery need to be divided for adequate exposure. Care should be taken to avoid excessive retraction or placing instruments in the tracheoesophageal groove, where the recurrent laryngeal nerve can be injured. Figure 16.7. The cervical esophagus is mobilized by blunt dissection, beginning in the prevertebral space and working medially. The tracheoesophageal groove is opened with blunt dissection that is continued medially to connect with the prevertebral dissection. Figures 16 to 8 and 16 to 9. Now that the proximal and distal esophagus is mobilized, the tracheal dissection is begun to fully mobilize. The remaining esophagus is continued. Continuous traction is placed on each of the Penrose drains encircling the ends of the esophagus while the Zuchen bluntly develops the prevertebral plane with his or her right hand through the hiatus and left hand through the cervical incision. Figure 16 10. A Penrose drain is looped around the esophagus and retracted superiorly while blunt dissection of the esophagus is continued to the level of the carina. Dissection can be performed under direct vision through the enlarged hiatus, by blunt finger dissection, or using a thoracoscope. Figure 16 11. A sponge on a stick can help facilitate this dissection from the cervical incision once the entire posterior esophagus is mobilized. The anterior section is mobilized in similar fashion during the anterior dissection. The surgeon must be careful not to injure the membranous portion of the trachea. The lateral esophageal attachments can be freed under direct vision from the hiatus with superior retraction of the chest wall. Lymph nodes in the subcarinal area should be dissected free and removed with the specimen if the lateral attachments cannot be viewed. An alternative method is to insert the surgeon's right hand through the hiatus and pin the esophagus against the spine between the index and middle fingers. The lateral tissue is then stripped from the esophagus by blunt dissection. Figures 16 to 12 to 16 to 14. Once the esophagus is fully mobilized, the cervical esophagus is divided obliquely with a gastrointestinal anastomosis (GIA) stapling device. Figure 16:15. The esophagus is pulled from the posterior mediastinum and delivered into the abdomen. At this point the surgeon should inspect the surgical bed for bleeding and insert a gauze pack into the posterior mediastinum to tamponade any minor oozing while the stomach is prepared. The fundus and distal greater curve of the stomach are grasped and held on tensile while the esophagus is pulled at a 90 degree angle. A gyre stapling device can be used to resect a portion of the lesser curve and gastric cardia to gain a 4 to 6 cm margin from a distal esophageal tumor for benign disease, only the cardia is resected to maximize collateral flow through the stomach. This process also tubularizes the stomach in preparation for use as a conduit. The staple line can be oversewn with 3 to 0 silk interrupted Lambert stitches. Figure 1616. The stomach is then manipulated through the enlarged hiatus to the cervical incision. A Babcock clamp can be inserted from the cervical incision into the posterior mediastinum to help grasp and deliver the fundus of the stomach into the neck. Figure 1617. Alternatively, a Penrose drain can be sutured to the apex of the stomach and delivered into the cervical incision to help provide traction. Both techniques use more pushing from the diaphragm side rather than pulling from the neck side. The surgeon must be careful to avoid twisting the stomach, which will compromise gastric blood flow and can lead to conduit necrosis with an astomotic breakdown. 
figures 16 to 18 to 16 to 20. The abdominal portion of the procedure is completed before the cervical anastomosis is performed. This allows time to assess the viability of the gastric conduit in the abdomen. The hiatus is closed by approximating the crura with 2 to 0 vicro figure of 8 stitches to easily allow two finger breadths between the stomach and hiatus. The stomach is also tacked to the diaphragm with interrupted 3 to 0 silk stitches to prevent subsequent gastric herniation into the chest. At this point a jejunostomy feeding tube can be placed according to surgeon prep. Many techniques have been described to complete the cervical esophagogastric anastomosis. Stapled anastomoses have shown a low Lower incidence of anastomotic leak over hands sewn anastomoses once an adequate length of stomach, 4 to 5 centimeters, has been mobilized above the clavicles, the suture line from the lesser curve is oriented toward the patient's right, and a traction suture is placed on the anterior wall of the stomach at the lower aspect of the neck wound, figures 16 to 21 and 16 to 22. A 1.0 to 1.5 cm gastrotomy is performed on the anterior gastric wall, 3 to 4 cm distal to the tip of the fundus lying high in the neck, figures 16 to 23 and 16 to 24, and a traumatic clamp is placed parallel to the esophageal staple line keeping the oblique orientation to ensure the anterior portion of the esophagus is longer than the posterior portion to facilitate the anastomosis. A traction stitch is placed on the anterior corner of the cervical esophagus and pulled cord ed while one arm of the endoscopic gastrointestinal anastomosis, endogyre, stapling device is placed through the gastrotomy toward the fundus and the other arm placed into the esophagus along its posterior wall the stapling device is fired and individual 4 to 0 absorbable sutures are then placed at the corners of the stapled anastomosis at this point the anesthesiologist inserts an azogastric ng tube while the surgeon guides the tube through the partially completed anastomosis and into the distal stomach figure 1625 the remaining small opening between the esophagus and gastrotomy is closed in two layers a running 4 to 0 absorbable suture is used for the FRST layer followed by interrupted 4 to 0 Lambert stitches to complete the anastomosis. Figure 1626, the neck wound is filled with saline and the anesthesiologist gently introduces 50 milliliters of air into the NG tube while the surgeon occludes the distal stomach and observes for air bubbles at the anastomosis in the neck. The completed anastomosis should lie high in the neck without tension. Figure 1627, closing before closure, the entire stomach should be inspected for areas of necrosis. The abdominal fascia is closed with an zero-looped running polydioxanone suture, PDS, or according to Zuch end preference, then the skin closed with staples in the neck. A small Jackson Pratt drain is placed in the surgical bed and exited through a separate stab incision in the lateral neck. The platysma is approximated with a running 4 to 0 absorbable suture. Then the skin closed with a second 4 to 0 to 5 to 0 absorbable stitch. A chest radiograph should be obtained in the operating room to ensure no pneumothorax or hematorax is present. If pneumothorax or hematorax is present, appropriate chest tubes should be inserted. The need for extensive postoperative monitoring in the intensive care unit (ICU) is based on surgeon preference, patient comorbidities, blood loss, and length of procedure. However, Routine acute care is not required postoperatively hallmarks to a rapid recovery lie in adequate pain control, physical therapy, and pulmonary toilet. The esophagogastrostomy should be evaluated on postoperative day 4 or 5 with a contrast swallow study if no leak is present. A diet is initiated and the drain is removed as long as the output does not increase with feeding if an anastomotic leak occurs. The neck incision should be opened and packed with moist gauze two to three times daily. The wound is allowed to granulate and close. Secondarily identify and preserve the right gastropoploic and right gastrocarteries during mobilization of the stomach. Vagal fibers around the myocephagus can be difficult to dissect bluntly using the vertebral bodies posteriorly as an anvil against which to compress tissues can facilitate blunt dissection. Communicate with the anesthesiologist especially during transthoracic dissection when periods of hypertension are common keep dissection close to the proximal esophagus to minimize potential injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerves.